Well, hi, Harold. How are you today? I'm doing great, Glenn. It's always good to talk to you. It is very good to be talking. I'm talking to Harold Pollock, who's uh, got a chair, I believe, in the School of Social Service Administration at the University of Chicago, professor of social policy over there. And this is Glenn Lowry, The Glenn Show at bloggingheads.tv. I teach economics at Brown University. Harold is a, a frequent uh, contributor to The Glenn Show. I guess we can put it that way. And we are on. Uh, and Harold, I had thought, I mean, the reason I ask you to have this conversation is I really want to learn something from you about the debate ongoing now uh, regarding repealing and replacing Obamacare, as the president uh, refers to it, with a bill scheduled to be voted on tomorrow. Today is Wednesday, um, March 22nd. According to the calendar of the House of Representatives, there's going to be a big vote uh, tomorrow on the uh, House Republican plan to repeal and replace Obamacare. Uh, there is so much going on in the health care policy debate, uh, and I'll, I'll keep this introduction short just by saying that, you know, you're an old friend, I've known you for 30 years, and I know that you had a lot of blood and sweat and, and passion and uh, investment of your personal self involved in the Affordable Care Act, uh, 2010, uh, an extension of the welfare state, a kind of significant political accomplishment, at least so it would have been seen at the time of uh, President Barack Obama. Uh, you helped to make it happen uh, in, in your way, and, and now it's on the, you know, it looks like it's going to the cutting room floor, or whatever the right metaphor is, so I'll stop. Uh, what do you think and how do you feel about uh, what's going on in health healthcare policy debate uh, these days, it, it is it, there is a lot going on, and it is it's a very strange time. You could make an argument that both parties lost the November election in the in terms of health policy because when the ACA has never been popular, right up until the point where there was a serious chance it could be repealed, it is now more popular than it's ever been. And and it's and what we're discovering is aspects of ACA have really become embedded in the fabric of American life. And Republicans are kind of like I use the analogy. They're the they're the bear who caught the car. It's not the dog who caught the car because the bear can do a lot more damage to the car. And, uh, you know, Republicans are going to do a lot of damage to the health care system. But what they're discovering is that and by Republicans, by there's several different groups, Republican governors, it turns out. Uh, are very, very identified with aspects of the ACA and have been working pretty effectively to implement it and don't want it overturned. Uh, and, you know, House Republicans are uh, about to pass a bill which is extremely unpopular with the American public and is extremely unpopular with most of their Republican colleagues around the country and is completely at variance with what President Trump said he was going to do during the campaign. Uh, you know, one of the challenges is that the unpopular things about ACA are really about the health insurance coverage in the state marketplaces. Deductibles are high for people, particularly people who have incomes above about 250 percent of the federal poverty line. So, you know, we're talking about a single person who might have an income of like, uh, you know, thirty eight thousand dollars, say that person doesn't get enough financial help in the exchanges and. Uh, you know, and, and faces pretty high deductibles and their experience, uh, on, on the Obamacare exchanges has been, has been difficult. And a lot of, for people, for low income people, people with incomes below roughly 250% of the poverty line, uh, ACA has actually been quite successful. But, uh, but of course that's not the group that drives American politics. And one of the ironies, by the way, is that Medicaid turns out to be better as a human experience than the private insurance coverage that people are having. Uh, and uh, anyway, I, but, but the striking thing that I want to get to is Republican rhetoric has focused very much on things like the high deductibles and premiums that regular people are facing. But the actual bill that Paul Ryan has crafted uh, would make everything that they are complaining about worse. And as soon as it was scored by the Congressional Budget Office, it's basically, you know, been yeah you know, as that's become concrete 
uh, no one quite knows what to do with that because, you know, for example, for a 64-year-old person earning $26,500 a year, I'll just give you the example that the Congressional Budget Office gave. Under Obamacare, that person's premium in the non-group market, the net premium would be about $1,700. Under the House bill that was scored by the CBO, that would go up to $14,600. That is politically self-immolating. So Republicans are trying to figure out, what do I do with this? Okay, so they've got a problem, but but uh, let me just ask you uh, what the president is saying, President Trump, is mm-hmm. that Obamacare is a disaster. And what these talking head Republicans that I see coming on the Sunday shows are saying is that uh, the uh, death spiral has begun, uh, insurance companies are pulling out. Uh, so many counties in the uh, country have only one uh, p- person selling and so forth. And uh, they are repeating some of the things that you just said about uh, high deductibles and whatnot. And they're saying things like uh, the Obamacare mandates that people buy a, a, a particular kind of government uh, dictated insurance, et cetera, et cetera. I won't repeat all the rhetoric. You know what they're saying. There's nothing to any of that. Obamacare is not a disaster. Uh, The exchanges are not collapsing in a death spiral. Um, The adverse selection uh, bear is not coming to get us. And uh, there isn't any issue with respect to competition between insurance providers in uh, the various places and companies are not pulling out. I mean, just uh, I got it that the Republicans have a problem crafting a bill that will be politically acceptable. This I see. On the one hand, they have their conservatives who don't like the idea of Obamacare, Medicaid expansion. They want to block grant stuff to the states, et cetera, et cetera. On the other hand, they have people who are getting benefits who will be, uh, such as this example that you just gave, uh, uh, hurt by uh, the changes that they're contemplating. So, you know, finding a path through that is going to be difficult for them. But is the status quo anti acceptable uh, and so forth? I, you know, so, I'm sorry. I, I want to hear from you about that. I would say that there's different aspects of ACA. The Medicaid expansion, I think, has been more successful than uh, than you might have expected. But I think that the exchanges have been less successful. And it varies a lot depending on where you are. But I think the idea I, – I think there's a couple of issues here. One is that they have no – it's a delicate – thing to try to create. You're trying to craft this market-based model that involves insurance companies, involves state government, involves federal regulators, involves efforts to maintain a proper risk pool through the individual mandate. Uh, when When we did that in Medicare Advantage, the initial efforts had a lot of problems, but there was bipartisan pragmatic problem solving around it, and they pumped a lot of money in and were and have been able to make it work and make it political. Politically durable. The exchanges have, there's only one political owner of the Obamacare state exchanges, and that and that person is not in office anymore. And his name is Barack Obama. It turns out that no one has a stake in the success of these exchanges, who's in a position to make them work now. And Republicans have actually spent since ACA, they've really tried hard to undermine the risk pool in these exchanges, and have seen political advantage to to essentially creating that death sparrow. Now, according to CBO... Oh, hold on, hold on. I'm going to understand this. The Republicans sabotaging the exchanges by not implementing marginal uh, improvements or alterations in the structure of the law that uh, would be required because the original formulation was in some way flawed. I mean, am I following you? I don't want to put words in your mouth. Well, that's one aspect. And another aspect is there were payments to insurance companies that were supposed to compensate them if the risk pool turned out to be more risky than anticipated. Something called the three R's. There's a set of there's a set of complex. Oh, this was uh, the Marco Rubio move where he blocked the uh, transfers to insurance companies that were built into the original ACA that would compensate yeah. them for losses and uh, keep them uh, involved in the exchanges. Yeah, and and you know, and I, I, I when I step back to it. And uh, I should tell you, I was not only do I have a chair at the University of Chicago, but I was the president of the health politics and policy section of the American Political Science Association. You know, I've, I've just got I can you I got, can you got I, my attention, Harold. You got my attention. You know, when I step back from my partisan and ideological commitments and I say, what are we learning about the intersection of politics and policy in America? Yeah, you have this. 
delicate thing that really requires a lot of difficult implementation, adjustment, collaboration, uh, financial subsidies. You're starting this new thing. Insurance companies didn't really know how to do it at first in the way that was most effective, all these kinds of things. And it turns out that in a highly partisan environment, yeah. you can't do that. Now, let me contrast that with the Medicaid expansion. In my research on substance use, I talked to a lot of Republicans around the country. And when I talk to people in state governments about what are you doing about the opioid epidemic, we have a really detailed conversation about that you know, uses terms like the ASAM treatment criteria and like the real stuff. You know, you, it's not political. Okay. They are – they are really – you don't become the – I mean some states you do, but in most states you don't become the head of the state department of Medicaid so that you can sabotage stuff. Right. Uh, you know, you, you want to do stuff that works. And you know, John Kasich and others, they've put billions and billions of dollars into stuff that they care about, and it turns out that it's not what I would want to do. You know, it's a conservative vision, but there's real bipartisan health policy in the Medicaid expansion – that is dealing with the toughest public health problems in the country, and it's actually working surprisingly well, uh, whereas the Obamacare marketplaces turn out both politically and pragmatically, uh, they're not working so well. In terms of keeping the costs down, the problem is no one has dealt with the problem that provider providers really have so much market power that even whatever insurance companies do, it's very difficult to contain costs. And uh, now for people who are highly subsidized on the exchanges, you know, two-thirds of the people on the uh, exchange. Again, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm sorry. I just want to make sure I am understanding you because if I don't follow you, many listeners are not going to follow you as well. The providers in your just previous sentence are insurance providers or are they health service providers? Well, I mean, I mean hospitals, doctors. Okay. So they have market power and can, in effect, bargain their way to prices higher than they otherwise might be able to. And unless yeah. there was somehow more competition – uh, in the market for uh, medical service provision, um, we, we, we're going to have a problem keeping costs down. Again, am I following you? Absolutely. People, you know, insurance. If insurance companies were the problem, we would have solved the cost issue in healthcare a long time ago, because they basically I have a friend who says, you know, they pull with Bernie Madoff. You know, they're not popular, and um, they are not the problem. The, the problem the problem is we pay high prices for medical services and the entire supply side of the medical economy uh, you know has a very strong interest in making sure that that continues and that's why things like the public option were an incredibly heavy lift uh, you know all around Chicago right now my institution and many others are building these huge Taj Mahals for for tertiary care yeah. uh, you know built and, and 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 so on um, but I think when I think of what makes me feel optimistic about health policy in America is really when I see – when I – not the Obamacare exchanges, but when I look at the Medicaid expansion. Okay. I, help me understand this. Why is Medicaid expansion working well? Sounds a little bit like a single payer for people who are not quite uh, – you know, not quite poor. And, yeah. and uh, why are the exchanges uh, floundering? Well, I think there's a couple of issues. One is – there's genuine give and take between politicians of different parties who are actually accountable for results. You know, if you're the governor of Ohio, you're worrying about your hospitals, you're worrying about hundreds of thousands of people and, that you are responsible for serving. And, you know, you, if you're a House member, you know, if you're a member of the House Freedom Caucus, you can just burn everything down. And, and that's what they're doing. That's what they want to do. Uh, you know, you're not accountable for making things work. And, the Obama administration and Republican governors really, not just on the Medicaid exchange, uh, Medicaid expansion, but a lot of Medicaid issues, they've quietly negotiated. Uh, you know, Mike Pence, uh, you know, people across the country, you know, Arkansas, a lot of a lot of pretty conservative states where they say, you know, we want the federal money, uh, you know, we really need it, uh, but we want to put our stamp on it. And so they negotiate, and, they, and there's things that Harold Pollack doesn't like. You know, there's premiums sometimes, or there's, or they'll tr they want to charge people a copay for the emergency room, which I don't like. Work but requirement, you know, work requirement, is isn't a work requirement for Medicaid recipients in the uh, current version of the Republican uh, reform bill? Yeah, it is, and I don't like. I mean, they want to, they want to cast Medicaid as welfare, and and yeah. uh, and there's a lot that I 
uh, don't like about that. And block granting. I, I just want to hear you on these specifics. Mm -hmm. Block granting of the Medicaid the money to the states, giving them more flexibility in how it's uh, how it's allocated. Now, block granting, that is a different story. Let me separate out the work requirements and stuff like that. I think that a lot of those issues, there needs to be negotiation, and, and I want to understand what are you actually going to do. Yeah. And, and you know, I'd rather have Indiana Medicaid with things I don't like than Texas no Medicaid where people literally die because they're not – I mean people will die because of this. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean if you have a stroke in Texas and you're uninsured, and, you know, your income is too low for ACA – you will, you know, you will go bankrupt. You know, you will have, you know, things are happening every day. And I would much rather, you know, in Indiana, you, you have a Medicaid program Harold doesn't like in all of its details. There's actually human care that will be given and, 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 uh, and the hospital knows it will get paid and so on. Now, so now block granting is a different issue because block granting fundamentally changes the program and is essentially a way to cut the program with plausible deniability. And everything that Republicans criticize about Medicaid will be made much worse under block grants, which is uh, because, you know, for example, the biggest single problem in Medicaid is that it just pays doctors and hospitals too little. Probably private insurance pays too much. But Medicaid pays too little, and that means that people can't get access to services that they need, and safety net providers like Stroger Hospital uh, don't get the funds that they need to to be successful. If you block, uh, there's two flavors of block grants. Uh, one is just every state gets a fixed amount of money for you know this year you get six billion dollars for yeah. your state, and once you do that, that is basically saying to the state you have a huge incentive to cut that program in every way that you can uh, because because if you bring another person on the program, you don't get more money. If you cover another service, you don't get more money. If you, if you raise the amount that you're paying the providers, you don't get more money. And there's no home address for the cuts that come because the governor of the state, when people complain about the cuts, says, well, go to the federal government. They haven't given me the money. And the federal government says, why are you talking to me? The governor enacted this cut. He could spend well, the money. Well, hold on. Hold on. Just, so, just let me ask you on this. Well, why is the federal government the, the sort of taxer of last resort here? Why can't the governor raise taxes at the state level to pay for a program? Why does he get to uh, lay off the political responsibility for cuts uh, on the feds? Where is it mandated that the feds have to underwrite this? I mean, we're a federal system. There's taxing at all levels of government. Well, we, we've made a basic decision that if you're a poor person in Mississippi, that, you're, that your access to basic health services should not be totally dependent on uh, – uh, the decisions in fiscal capacity in the state capital that both is a very low income state and a state that has a very tenuous commitment to the well-being of poor people. So I would distinguish, and I'm not arguing with you, I'm just trying to understand the terrain between um, the, the wherewithal, the financial wherewithal to provide the services and the judgments about what services need to be provided, which are political uh, value type calculations. And it seems to me that one could argue, you say, cutting without in dis by disguise, cutting without uh, with plausible deniability, and that's about the level of the federal transfer to the states under a block granting. It could be higher than what some Republicans might want it to be, and it would still be block granting. And the judgment about whether or not or how to take care of poor people, I, again, I'm not arguing with you. I, I really just want to put the thing on the table. Is is not obvious to me that it needs to be made at the federal level. It's not obvious to me that states can't vary. And the California might want to be more generous to its poor than Texas, and I'm not sure I see anything wrong with that. Uh, well, California already has. By the way, let me make a microeconomics 101 point, yeah. which is what block grants do is they change the slope of the budget line. So it's not just the amount of subsidy that's given; it's really that you go from a matching grant to uh, you know to one where the state pays dollar for dollar without w without any block grants medicaid programs already vary dramatically across the state some states cover dental care some states don't some pay doctors a lot some pay doctors a little you can do pretty much anything you want in medicaid right now and the way and the waiver system that exists right now the obama administration gave tremendous flexibility to states there were of course some things that states wanted to do that the obama administration didn't like in part because what states needed politically was to do something that the obama administration didn't like as a way to 
to provide a politically dignified path to take money from the Obama administration. So they were they were desperately trying to find something that they could extract from the Obama administration so that they could go to their own stakeholders. But you don't need a block grant structure to give states flexibility. They already have a whole variety of waiver programs that allow states to do all sorts of you know tremendously varied things in Medicaid. Medicaid is the most varied healthcare system. You compare that to Medicare, Medicare is much more uniform. And of course one reason Medicare is more uniform is because seniors have always said we don't want to have to put our our confidence in the full faith and credit of the state of Illinois over our basic health care. Uh, you know, we, we trust the federal government more. Okay, let me go let's do this economics one on one thing just one step further. Because it may not be a bad thing to change the slope of the budget line. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm thinking of the following example. I just learned about this recently, listening to the very fine economist, Stephen uh, Raphael, you know who I'm talking about from the Goldman yeah. School at UC Berkeley, very talk funny. about reduction in incarceration rates in California. He said the following thing, and I'll be brief. He mm -hmm. said one of the issues with California prison numbers getting so high, and they were up into like the 175,000 people incarcerated at one point, mm -hmm. was that... Uh, people were being revoked in their parole because they, you know, would fail a drug test or, um, you know, uh, not show up for a, a meeting with their uh, uh, parole officer or whatever, and they'd be uh, recommitted to prison. And the decision about uh, parole revocation was being made by county officials, but the cost of incarcerating the person who was being revoked was being, uh, was being borne by the state. And so they did the following thing. They said, I tell you what. If you if you revoke the parole on somebody, he's going to go to the county jail, at least for the first year of uh, however it is. And so now the it's county is looking at, oh, my God, I, I do this and I'm going to have to pay for incarcerating this person at the county level. And so guess what? The numbers just fell off the table yeah. of people whose paroles were being revoked after this uh after this alteration in the incentives went in. In other words, the county had a different because they were seeing dollar for dollar. They had skin in the game about uh, how they handled the management of these cases. And uh, it's only an analogy. I'm not saying it's a perfect fit, but it just as illustrates that I might want to put some, put some weight on the lower level of uh, public administration in order to get them to take the right action. Well, you know, I, I think that's a very good point. And one of the questions that we need to think about is, uh, you know, every system creates incentives. And the concern that I have about Medicaid is that you have – you have the most politically marginalized constituencies in the country. Uh, let's say, you know, if I go to an extreme, I have African Americans living in the Mississippi Delta to go to an extreme but not imaginary case. Yeah. And they're already being underserved by the state government that yeah. they, that, and how, and so if I strengthen the incentives on that state to provide them even less, uh, the human consequences of that are going to be significant. If I if I had the same, the thing about medical care that's that what what makes Medicaid so poignant is that it is the most disciplined health care structure in the country in terms of the amount of money spent per person of a given health status. You know, we we pay very little to doctors to hospitals for Medicaid. You know, it's really a pretty tight program compared to what the health care is that you and I get. And, uh, you know, and so if we want to put fiscal discipline into the healthcare financing system, the pe the marginal populations in Medicaid would not be the places where I would want to start. And, uh, it, and, uh, um, but I think what's really been edifying in the debate that's been going on now is that I think it is widely recognized across the political spectrum that me the value of Medicaid and the public health benefit that we've gotten from the ACA Medicaid expansion. And I think some of it is happenstance because it happens to coincide with the opioid epidemic and Medicaid has been a critical tool to deal with the problem in these rural areas that have these horrible opioid problems. And a lot of, <laughs> a lot of politicians are saying, you know, including President Trump, when during he, he campaigned, during his campaign, yeah. he spoke in very humane terms about this. Right. Uh, and you know that Medicaid is the tool that we use to help all of the populations that are at the highest risk, whether it's HIV. A third of the people living with HIV in Illinois are insured under the ACA Medicaid expansion. So I mean that is that is the tool that we have to really reach these groups who otherwise would not be served or would not be served properly. A and, third. Uh, say, say that again. A third of what population again? People living with HIV. 
Oh, HIV, a third of them are in the expansion? You mean they, their incomes were too high to qualify for Medicaid prior to the expansion? Well, if you're a – I mean, think about who is it that the ACA expansion really picks up? One of the absolutely central populations is just low-income men who are not moms, who are not vets, who don't have a federally qualified disability that would get them on SSI. You know, uh, who are these people? You know, people at risk for HIV – People with substance use disorders, people going through the criminal justice system. Yeah. Uh, and what's interesting about the Republican reaction, you might have thought that Republicans would have Willie Hortonized this reality. And they would be saying, hey, ACA, Medicaid expansion is like picking up all the people. Oh, these are bad people, yeah. And you know, they have not done that. Undeserving by... people. But you know, they've they not done it. Not... Why not? Why do you think not? Because I think that I think that on the ground – Republican politicians at the state and local level, particularly, and also people you know in the Senate, uh, they see the human reality of that, and they see the value of providing better care for these people, and uh, and they have and they have not um, they they have demagogued other aspects of ACA, but I think that they value. Um, doing a better job in this area. And and I don't think that all Republicans in Washington have gotten the memo that it is not uh, – that it is, it is not a politically popular thing uh, to try to go after these programs and that it creates enormous problems for their own colleagues throughout the system when – They've invested, you know, when if Governor Kasich has invested billions of dollars to try to do something about these problems, uh, you know, he he doesn't want you to mess with that. He said there was a letter that Republican governors sent about the House bill, and it was very interesting to compare that letter to the materials that the House Republicans have produced about their own bill. And the most striking thing was that these governors, it was a much more professional policy document that really showed a tactile sense of what, here's the implications of what you're doing. Yeah. And here's the different ways you could block grant and the different implications for cost growth. And we want you to do it this way rather than that way. And if you stripped away the, uh, you know, the, the the talking points and the rhetoric, of course, you know, of course they started Obamacare is a disaster. Sure. Blah, blah, blah. Um, it is a governing document, and that's not what is being that, that's not the way the House Republicans are talking about their bill. They really, I and I, I wonder if they even expect that it will be enacted into law. Well, um, well, let me ask you, what do you think is going to happen? Uh, as I said, they're voting on this tomorrow. Um, so I, I canvassed 67 healthcare leaders this week just by email. I actually did it because I'm teaching a course on decision analysis and I want to talk about motivated reasoning and prediction and, and I, I sent out emails to, these are people that, people you, people you read about in the newspaper who are, you know, people that were in the Obama White House, people who ran, uh, you know, uh, Medicare and Medicaid, uh, Republican and Democrat, you know, serious top people. Um, so 90% of them said that they thought that the Republicans would pass this bill. Uh, although they, I asked them for their probability, their average probability was about 74%. So, so, so almost, so, so you make of that what you will. You've been reading Philip Tetlock, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yes. <laughs> and, anyway, uh, anyway, go ahead, go ahead. So most of them think – because Republicans regard it as existential basically that they not you – know, basically will be laughed out of town if we uh, – Yeah, political disaster if they don't get this done. Yeah, and and now by, and when Republicans talk about it, I've talked to Republican congressmen about it, and that's really what they say. You know, Basically, we, we've been saying this for seven years. We're going to overturn Obamacare. If we don't do that, we will just yeah. – we will laugh out of town. What they don't talk about is pride in the substance of the bill. It's a very poorly crafted bill in the by the assessment of everybody, Democrats, Republicans, everyone who's looked at it. It is it is it is shambolic in its policy details. Uh, and so what all, but most of the people that I talk to say is they'll they'll bully something out of the House and then the Senate will take this thing up. And whatever the Senate does is kind of going to become the law, you know, that that. Uh, uh, and I think that's a pretty realistic prediction that that um, uh, so and I, and I think one of the interesting aspects of this is that 
I, I think the exchanges will will take a hit in a lot of ways. Um, but I think that the Medicaid things that I care the most about may well survive, and that and and the the terms of the debate are very much what a Democrat would want them to be. It turns out that when you actually get down to it, the Republicans have had to concede. Well, oh, we're we don't want to leave millions more people uninsured. We don't want to. Uh, you know, the, the idea that we want to give people high, more skin in the game with high deductible policies, it turns out the American public hates that. And even though that's what actually a lot of these bills might do, that is not the terms on which Republicans can can explain what they're doing to the public. And, and once their bill is passed, I think it will be very damaging to Republicans politically once its on the ground impact becomes felt. And I think Republicans believe that right now, and that's what's really giving them pause. So they really about, are – if, as I listen to you, it just occurs to me they really are in a tight spot. I mean, the Freedom Caucus is going to go ballistic, presumably at the at the implications of uh, what you're saying, which is uh, a senatized Senate revised version of the House bill becomes law, which basically enshrines forever the Medicaid expansion, which is the sort of creeping hand from their point of view of the of the welfare state moving into health care for however many tens of millions of people are in that zone of the expansion coverage. Yeah. Uh, and at the same time, uh, they're going to upset the apple cart for a lot of people and uh, end up pissing a lot of people off because it's uh, it's half measures and it's cutbacks and it's whatnot like that, where the guy that's uh, highlighted in the uh, CBO scoring uh, report uh, is uh, emblematic of, of people who are, who are dispossessed. So they they kind of like are untrue to their ideological moorings and, and uh, uh, at the same time, uh, you know, kind of getting not, you know, the president said, I'm going to do this. They all promised they're going to do it. They did it. But uh, it's a political headache nonetheless. Yeah, I think that's right. Well, I think the problem is that an honest accounting of what they want to do ideologically in this bill yeah. would be rejected by everyone, including their own core voters. And it is not what President Trump ran on at all. And so they they suddenly have this dilemma that this sort of put up or shut up moment. And one of the consequences, by the way, the reason their bill is so unprofessional is that they never expected – they kept pushing these bills to Obama you know, that would repeal Obamacare. In fact, Secretary Price wrote one of those, which would have uninsured 22 million people. They, uh they never took the time that the Democrats took in 2006, 7, and 8 to really coalesce around a policy vision that that is sort of implementable and where they got the stakeholders together to really coalesce around a, a policy vision they embrace. Uh, and so what they have to do now is cobble together something that is politically acceptable uh, – that that makes some headway on the things that they want, but that really retreats from their core ideological commitments, which just have been rejected by the country. And uh, but yet they still hold. I've never seen a case where a party has seized all the levers of power, and they have seized it based on a seven-year announcement: we're going to repeal Obamacare. And now they come in and they have no public standing to do exactly the thing that they promised to do. Yeah. Let, let me ask you something else that occurs to me just off the top of my head here. Uh, we were both around, you and I, in the 90s, 20 years ago or so, when a Republican Congress, Newt Gingrich, was the speaker in 1994 mm -hmm. election. And they wanted to reform welfare, mm -hmm. which Bill Clinton himself had promised to do in welfare as we know it and such. But yeah. the bill that came out of the Congress was uh, hor uh, horrific to many observers in terms of uh, imposing work requirements and time limits and uh, family caps and other such or allowing the states to yeah. do this and uh, cutting benefits and predictions were made. I don't know what the CBO might have said, but predictions were made by well-informed observers about what the likely uh, disastrous consequences were going to be. And so forth and so on. The net result was, I think, and correct me, you're the professor of social service administration, that um, the bill passed. It was enacted. The Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act of uh, 1996 or whatever it was. And uh, Bill Clinton got reelected and the changes went into effect around the country. And welfare was completely, that is, assistance to needy families, financial assistance, completely re reformed. 
And uh, no doubt there were hardships and difficulties, but my sense of it is, with 20 years hindsight, is that the disasters that were predicted did not occur and that the uh, consequences of welfare reform were politically acceptable to the populace ex post facto because there was no real effort to ever go back and do anything else with it. Uh, is that reading history wrongly, and is that history at all relevant to our current moment? Well, that's a great example. It, it certainly is relevant, although it's relevant in part for the what makes it different. And uh, I mean, one thing is the AFDC TANF program was is maybe one thirtieth the size of Medicaid. This is worth m- noting. Really, God! Yeah. I mean, my sense of orders of magnitude is way off. I would have never thought that. I would have said less. Maybe even an order of magnitude less. One thirtieth. Wow. I mean, I mean, AFDC. You could never have done welfare reform the way that they did it with any program that involved a larger and more influential set of constituents. Oh, the constituency. Yeah. Okay. And it's not only that AFDC TANF is tiny, it's also that it's a cash payment to a politically marginal group. Yeah, okay. Uh, that is a completely different situation from hundreds of billions of dollars going to highly organized interest groups that touch everything about the U.S. economy. You know, the University of Chicago Medical Center Got had it. no opinion about welfare reform. Uh, <laughs> you know? uh, but they damn sure are worried about that Medicaid uh, reimbursement formula. <laughs> yeah, they're all over that one, and uh, and it's um, um and, now I mean by the way, the human consequence there's the political consequences of welfare reform and there's the human consequences. Yeah, I actually I was appalled by welfare reform when it happened, although I think liberals tend to lose sight of the fact that ten AFDC was always a small and bad program, and that if you look at the totality of the w- American welfare state. A lot of people think we retrenched the welfare state in the mid 1990s, and we just didn't. It turned the EITC is much larger, food yeah. stamps is much larger. There's a school breakfast and lunch. It turns out everything except for AFDC TANF expanded in the 90s. And so, if you look at consumption of among poor households, yeah. you don't see the disaster that welfare that welfare reform might have created in part because. It, it is it is a small program. Now, I do think also it, they happen to enact it just before an economic boom. And a lot of the negative human consequences of welfare reform actually did come, but they came in later recessions. And what we saw in 2007, 2008 yeah. was the percentage of children who are below the poverty line who are getting uh, AFDC, who are getting TANF, is very low, and and the ben- and the maximum benefit structure is very low. And if you've seen Kathy Eden's work, Luke Schaefer's work, there's a group of people who are destitute, who are being shut out. For there really is a human consequence. But welfare reform was a fundamentally much more politically and financially tiny endeavor compared to hammering the, our 3.4 trillion dollar medical economy. And so. So I don't. I think Paul Ryan likes to talk about Medicaid like welfare reform, and I can see why he wants to do that. Uh, but it is not the analogy is very poor, as he is discovering uh, himself. Uh, and and and, uh, and so. No, this is excellent. I I think I want to shift the subject a little bit, if you don't mind. We have uh, I don't know twenty minutes or so left in our conversation. Um, but uh, I've learned a lot just by listening to you, and I hope the audience has as well. Uh, so we'll see what's going to happen in the House of Representatives tomorrow and going forward. But, uh, you know, it's going to be a very entertaining political, uh, you know, uh, performance here. I'm going to get some popcorn and sit back in front of CNN and, and check it out. Um, but I want to ask you about, uh, cause there's other stuff that you do besides, uh, healthcare policy. Uh, and, um, I, I happen to have a recent conversation here at the Glenn Show with my son, Alden Keith Lowry, who's uh, Director of Research and Evaluation for the Metropolitan Planning Council of Chicago. And he's a lifelong Chicagoan. I was born in Chicago myself, having lived there since the late 1970s. But we were talking about the bodies dropping around uh, town uh, from all this homicide that's going on largely in uh, African-American neighborhoods. And, um, you know, the president, President Trump, making a big issue out of uh, violence in Chicago, and he's going to fix it, and this and that. And my son Alden saying, 
well, you know, if he's going to send in the feds, he better send in some uh, money with them. He better send in some jobs with them, some better education for the people who are living in these neighborhoods because he thinks, my son does, that uh, the violence problem in Chicago is very closely associated with socioeconomic disadvantage. Now, I want to say I think socioeconomic disadvantage is a bad thing, and I do believe that President Trump should send some jobs and some uh, support for education and so forth to Chicago and other such places. But I'm dubious as a social scientist about the claim that uh, the kind of violence that we're seeing in American cities, uh, in Chicago as a case in point, is accounted for uh, in any direct and causal way by uh, you know, labor market conditions or uh, the level of uh, general uh, social support. In that, and I put this before you because I know you know a lot about this, and especially in Chicago, in that... Uh, the kids who are actually carrying the guns and shooting each other, you know, are a very small selected uh, uh, pop part of the overall population of the city. And the, the dynamics that result in these uh, violent encounters are uh, sort of uh, linked to whatever they might be linked to. OK, so whether it's personal disputes or whether it's issues about gang uh, interactions and whatnot. I'm not saying there's no connection. I, I, again, want to be clear. More jobs for people would be a good thing as far as I'm concerned. And, you know, if you want to spend some more money on the health care of poor people or on the schools that they're sending their children to, I'm for that as well. Uh, but if you want to stop the killing, really, is it a matter of increasing the amount of the budgets of uh, certain social service agencies or, or what? So anyway, I want to put that question before you and get your reaction to that in the context of Chicago and more broadly. Well, there's a lot packed in there, and and I mean I'm the co-director of the University of Chicago Crime Lab and the University of Chicago Health Lab, and we do randomized trials of violence prevention interventions. I should say I'm kind of the Joe Biden of uh, of the crime lab. You know, Jens Ludwig is the Barack Obama of it, and is and is truly a personage. Uh, and, uh, is that you know, uh, Jens Ludwig? Yes. Uh huh. Yes. Okay. And and. Um, uh, well, so we did we, – but what we try to do in these randomized trials is to give people a realistic sense of evidence-based optimism, that we kind of know some things that would help. We can talk about what's the ultimate cause of the violence. I'm very much more focused on saying what are some scalable interventions that we know how to do. So if President Trump came to me and said, here's a pot of money, where would you spend it, that I could actually point to results. And okay. I'll mention – I'll mention two trials that I was involved in, <coughs> both in what they can accomplish and probably what they can't accomplish. Because uh, I do spend a lot of time. I've done two surveys now, one in the jail, one in the prison. I talk to a lot of offenders and to people, police people involved in these things. Uh, and I don't want to oversell what what we know and what we know how to do. Yeah. But so we did a we, we've done a randomized trial of, of an intervention called Becoming a Man. In Chicago, and I was I was the principal investigator on the first iteration of it. It's uh, it's gone on in several other iterations and is being expanded in a whole variety of ways. Uh, and it, the one that I was most tactile in in the first iteration uh, was in 16 uh, tough Chicago public schools uh, across the city. And it's a once a week group counseling intervention. I won't describe the details of it, but we demonstrated that. That while kids were participating in the program, they had a forty percent reduction in arrests for violent offending. Wow! And these are high school students. Uh, there were some that were a little younger, but yeah. Wow! And, and now, and we also Sarah Heller uh, coming out of the crime lab in a study that I helped her with uh, in its inception did has done randomized trials of of youth summer jobs and and showed similar reductions in violent offending when you give kids uh summer jobs and so we well do that's a direct contradiction to what i just said well you know it isn't it isn't i think we know i think that the median boy in a tough chicago high school we can do some things that reduces his chances of getting involved in violence and and that's a really important message. Okay, I need to ask you, what is violence uh, in the context of these uh, uh, random uh, assignment exercises you're doing? Oh, assault, armed robbery, uh, you know, being caught with a gun, you know, things that are uh, the real stuff. Okay. Uh, and, 
Now, but the other question you is... You say it is and it isn't. I, I, didn't, I didn't quite understand. Forgive me for interrupting. Uh, so we do, yeah. and, by, by, and I should tell you that among the kids on day one of our intervention, a third of the kids, and, and our, our kids basically looked a lot like the median boy in a tough high school in Chicago. A third of them had been arrested before our intervention started. So these are people that are in contact with the criminal justice system. Yeah. Uh, but the other, but I, I was giving this talk. You know, we, of course we have we we have you know we have a power, we have killer PowerPoint decks that show you know the reduction of stuff. And and I gave this talk and someone said you know Dr. Pollock, congratulations you're re you're reducing mass incarceration of violence and you're doing it in the right way. And this person was quite moved and I was quite moved to have this. <coughs> But, and then I said to her, you know, you have to understand that I'm not reducing mass incarceration with these interventions because the people in the prison are at a more extreme end of the distribution. And to really reduce the the hardcore stuff, we also need to deal with uh, – we need to deal with that aspect. And, and I think that um, – you know, so okay. So, uh, so there's so you, w there's not going to be a polio vaccine for this, but okay. there's a set of stuff we can do that is helpful. Let me see if I'm following you. So, becoming a man, as an example, is an intervention which you've been able to show with carefully structured experimental design uh, has a substantial reduction in the incidence of uh, uh, getting in trouble for violent offending. In the larger population of, let's say, high school attendees and tough neighborhoods in Chicago, but that's no guarantee that we know what to do to alter the most dramatically violent behavior from people who might be engaged in homicidal acts or things like that, who are a smaller proportion of that population, but who are also uh, more difficult to reach and to have their behavior altered. Did I, yeah. is, is that correct? Yeah. yeah so, and I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to ask you to tell me a little bit about what becoming a man is, if you can do that, if you feel like that's a good use of our time. I will do that. Before I do that, one second, I will just say that I'll make another methodological point, which yeah. is, which you're, you're, I know you're interested in renewal theory, so you will appreciate this <laughs> methodological byline. Uh, viewers may not know that you're a quite gifted uh, uh, mathematician, uh, aside from your uh, your other virtues. The um, so you know, the population of the prison at any given point, you might is a is a length bias sample of all the people who go into the prison. You know, so if you think of how do I pre you know preventing one guy who's going to serve ten years has the same impact as preventing ten guys who are going to serve one year in terms yeah. of reducing the prison population. And so a lot of our mass incarceration problem is how do we deal both in the prevention side and also in the sentencing side with the guys who have really committed serious felonies. Yeah. And that's the part that neither Democrats nor Republicans quite know how to talk about that our mutual friend Steve Tellus has done some really wonderful political science work on uh, to try to, to, to talk about how sentencing reform might be helpful there. Yeah. Um, now let me get to what, what programs like Becoming a Man do. Um, so, you know, it's one of the things that I've really learned as an urban public health researcher, crime researcher, it's hard to be a 17-year-old kid in the city of Chicago. Mm. And, you know, we basically have left to them to keep themselves safe and to deal with a really challenging and scary environment. And to do that while they have the apparatus of a testosterone-charged 17-year-old boy. So uh, so they develop a set of behaviors that are pretty scripted that actually have a basis in reality. So, uh, so you know, somebody steps on my sneaker yeah. uh, walking down the hallway of my high school. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I, I can't – I people are going to be able to see that and I've got a nice jacket and if I'm walking home, if people think you can just go and mess with me and I'm yeah. not going to respond – that that is a real problem for me, and uh, and so I might respond really aggressively, yeah. you know, as a scripted behavior, so that people know that I can't be messed with. Right. That script, boy, that can go badly, badly wrong yeah. if you respond automatically in that way in situations that could escalate into violence, or like the teacher gets in my face and I respond the same way, and then I get and then I fail my English class. 
because I, because in that moment I sort of cursed out the teacher when she embarrassed me in front of my friends. And so the, so programs like Becoming a Man try to help kids uh, using cognitive behavioral therapy and methods aligned to that. Try to help kids understand how do the, uh, how do I change the thought processes and my, and my biases about other people and my and my automatic behaviors that might lead me to uh, to escalate a situation I could get out of and they, and um, uh, and how do I how do I learn self regulation strategies and uh, so that I can stay focused on the things that I know are important. A lot of the kids in juvenile detention, uh, you know, they're the he just likes to quote the, some of the staff in the juvenile detention center where they'll say, you know, 80% of these kids, if they could take back five minutes of their life, they wouldn't be here right now. Right. And wow. so helping people with – but, you know, at one level you say these are adolescents with impulse control, but it's, but it's also adolescents in an environment where it's very, very natural for them to have to develop certain kinds of scripted behaviors that, that – the suburban kids don't have to develop. You know, uh, I can tell my kids. You know, somebody comes to take your iPhone, just give it to them. You know, it's your life isn't worth an iPhone. Uh, you know, you can't. You know, no, so I, I, I get that completely. Uh, let me, because this is something else that Alden, my son, said in our conversation of a couple of weeks ago about uh, violence in Chicago. He was very concerned about the um, call to increase the uh, imprisonment uh, sentencing treatment of uh, repeat gun offenders in the city and the logic of his argument was yeah yeah the guys who are doing the murderers are often illegal uh, uh, firearms violators too and yeah yeah these are my words but this is what he was saying you lock some of them up and you could probably reduce the violence on the other hand into that net you're going to also catch a large number of guys who are illegal vi gun uh, violators but they're just trying to stay alive. They're carrying the weapon because they live in a neighborhood where that actually keeps them alive or increases their probability of survival. They actually are not homicidal necessarily, but but they are uh, responding to. So that's like ratcheting up what you just said. You, what you just said about behavioral reflex and attitude. Now we got a decision about arming oneself, but the logic of it is similar. It's that I'm, it's a self defense strategy. And the punitive response to the violence, says Alden, and, you know, I'm listening to him and I'm trying to learn, uh, could, could uh, perhaps be effective with respect to the violence. We could debate that, but could almost certainly uh, be uh, creating uh, social injustices by ending up with guys getting five years for doing something that kind of, if you lived in that housing project and you had to run that gauntlet to get back and forth to school every day, or you actually wanted to go out in the evening after eight o'clock, uh, this is behavior that you probably would feel yourself required to engage in. You know, there's no – I go back and forth on this. So Phil Cook, Susan Parker, and I just published a study of uh, gun offenders in the Cook County Jail. We've got another study in Illinois State Prison with a similar population. Forty percent of the people that we interviewed have been shot in their adult life, not shot at. Wow. And actually found medical records for a lot or incident reports for a lot of those people in our prison study. Uh, you know, there was an incident, you know, so and, – and they would say things like, I would rather be judged by 12 than carried by 6. And um, – Good luck. Uh, well, yeah. And of course, anytime you hear a line like that, more, you realize, of course, it's a hip-hop lyric. <laughs> or, um, but um, – um, it's a real thing. These young guys are running around with guns and they're scared of each other and they're scared of each other for real reasons. And how do you disrupt that dynamic? And there's no beautiful way to do that that doesn't bring some human cost because what you said is completely right that there's a lot of guys walking around with guns who are doing it because they're scared. A lot of those same people – they then get into it with somebody and they've got the gun and a tragedy ensues. And, you know, New York, Los Angeles, there are places that have been able to break that dynamic. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of the ironies of the stop and frisk debate is that, you know, 
I think constitutionally, there's tremendous problems with stop and frisk, and the way that it's done uh, is often terrible. It is not. Uh, I think when New York was having 2,000 homicides a year, the idea that somebody on parole and probation would feel, you know, and if I walk out with a gun, there's a good chance some guy's going to come up and put his hand in my pocket and find that gun. You know, that's that that is that lowered the violence. Whatever it did, some other, it did a lot of other things too. Yeah. Uh, and uh, now, one of the challenges you have is the, the the loss of police legitimacy around things like the Laquan McDonald video. Yeah. Thing. yeah. You know, is of course for me the constitutional issues. I'm actually less fastidious about the constitutional issues than I am about what communities want police to do and what is acceptable in terms of low-income communities. If, if and you know, those are separate, we often run those things together and they're different. Um, I think we have to focus distinctively on the guns in some fashion and deter gun carrying and gun use. I'd rather do that through raising the probability of being arrested than by raising the penalty. Uh, you know, I don't want to crush people, but we do see that just a very large fraction of the people that are killing people and are being killed are people that have a lot of gun infractions. And uh, I think one of the good things is that in Chicago and many other places, they're pulling back on the nonviolent gun offenders. And actually, it links to part, different parts of our conversation. I was telling yeah. you offline that I was just involved in a study where we consented 40 nonviolent uh, gun uh, nonviolent drug offenders in, to go to treatment rather than to get arrested. And Medicaid expansion pays for all the services these people are getting. That's my, my product placement. Yeah. Now I'm done with the product placement. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that police recognize is, you know, if we, if we want communities to support us in more stringent gun enforcement, we've got to, we've got to, if we want to push the pedal on that, we've got to pull back on some of these other things. Uh, you know, the thing I find so interesting about what you're saying now, and I think we're going to need to conclude, is that the, sa the, the public safety issue is a little bit in conflict with the civil liberties issue. And it's a, just, it's a conundrum. It's just unavoidable. There's just no way around it. We don't want to increase the penalties for gun possession, let's say, uh, along the lines of my son Alden's concerns about who will end up in prison and for how long. But we do want to stop the violence, which means that we might want to increase the probability that you're detected with an illegal weapon uh, as a way of deterring you from carrying it, rather than increase the penalty for being caught with one. But to increase the probability of detection might require an infringement or a somewhat of a compromise with respect to how much privacy you've got, you know, and whether or not I can actually look inside your pocket or how frequently I do that. Uh, how many people who have no uh, uh, wrongful act at all are going to have their pockets looked in in order to find the 5% or whatever who might have a gun inside there? And, and that's, just, uh, that's just a problem. I mean, I'm not taking a position here. I'm just saying let's recognize what the trade-offs are and, and not pretend like they don't exist. And I, well, no, they do exist. Although I would, I would say that the crucial moderating variable in all of this is, is what, what, what do communities want police to be doing, and what will communities support the police in doing? If the community really embraces what the police are doing, they will tell you the guys whose pockets you should be putting your hand in. And yeah, that's a good point. Police are straight from the community. I mean, you, you know, you 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 did this wonderful interview about the book Ghetto Side, I did. where you have and. I mean, sort of right now we're stuck in this cycle of both of combined over enforcement and under enforcement that makes that trade off so much tougher because if police are basically flying blind and if they know that if something goes awry in their encounter yeah. that, that, that's rejected by the community, yeah, that's a that's a very bad situation for everybody. No, I got it's, it. It's a vicious circle. Then uh, the police behave in ways that alienate the community, but the community's alienation make the police more fearful and uh, require them to be more aggressive when they make dangerous encounters. Anyway, Harold, we got to call it a day here. This was a great conversation. Thanks for your time, and uh, we have so much to follow up on, so uh, let, let's renew our discussions uh, sometime soon. I Thank you so much, and uh, great talking to you. Yeah.